movie Enola Holmes 2 came out two days ago, so today I'm going to be reviewing the costumes from the film. One thing to note is that I am not a fashion historian, but I am a daily wearer of historical fashion, so I have a lot of real-world experience with this clothing. Therefore, the perspective on these costumes is coming from someone with first-hand personal experience. The movie is set around 1885. You were at the height of the second bustle era, which you saw bustles go to incredibly immense lengths. Sometimes they were so large that you could probably have an entire tea party on the back of one. And yes, I have made this joke before, but I'm going to make it again. <laughs> In addition to the second bustle era, you also had an offshoot of that, which was a style of aesthetic or reform dress. These are basically people who didn't want to subscribe to the expectations of women's fashion at the time, which for the upper class generally included a lot of big bustles and tight fit bodices. The costumes aren't meant to be historically accurate in this film at all, and sometimes I even question what really even is historical accuracy, but nonetheless I think it can be really fun to look at the different screens from the movie and kind of break down the looks and see how they maybe would have looked during the actual year of 1885. One overarching theme I noticed throughout this movie, at least with the women's wear of the main characters, is that a lot of the outfits seem to feel a lot more 1890-91 to me, rather than a mid-1880s look, because even though that's just a difference of five years, the fashion for women's wear at that point changes a lot. One look that I really love is this one of Enola sitting in her nightgown, getting ready before bed, and she's reading a letter. There's a lot of things that I feel like were done really well about this look. Firstly, her nightgown looks fairly historically accurate, and also I really like this shawl cover that she has over it. I also really like the way that her hair is curled with paper, because that is actually a curling method that people used historically to help get those really lovely ringlet curls, and they take a while to do so she'd probably need to set it overnight. In general, I just thought this was a really fun look and I thought it represented a historical time period really well. Before we go any further, let's catch up with Detective Birchwood, who's going to tell us about the sponsor of today's video. Huh, what's this? June's Journey. Much like Enola Holmes as a young detective working to solve murder mysteries, I've been solving some virtual murder mysteries myself. I'm not actually a detective. That's why June's Journey has been such a wonderful source of entertainment, satisfying my need to solve mysteries lately. Because I'm not ready for a career change. June's Journey is a free-to-download mobile game where you have to find hidden objects. I've really been enjoying playing the game lately because I find it really helps to decompress my mind between video editing, working, and sewing. And one of my favorite aspects is actually the antique and vintage illustrations. All of the illustrations are beautifully drawn, and the hidden object scenes feature items that would have actually been in the 1920s. So that really helps to immerse you in that entire world. And as an antique collector and a wearer of historical fashion, I can really appreciate one a game has a historical setting. Additionally, the game has a captivating detective story that takes you back to the 1920s with a diverse cast of characters. Since you're watching this video right now, I'm guessing that you probably love historical fashion and perhaps even detective mystery storylines too. Luckily, you can download June's Journey for free using the link in the description box below, and it's available currently as a mobile app for both iOS and Android, as well as on the PC with Facebook games. Thanks so much to June's Journey for sponsoring this video. Now back to reviewing Enola Holmes' two costumes. One of her other main looks is this sort of rusty orange jacket with this bluish skirt underneath. As an outfit, I really like this one. I think it's really flattering on her, and I also think it's really beautifully constructed but it does have a slightly more modern feel to it, and there's some reasons why. At the back of the skirt, you do sort of have this slight bustle, but again, it reminds me a lot more of the walking suits of 1890 rather than 85, because in 85, you'd most likely be having quite a large bustle in the back. For the jacket, I do really like the way that it comes to a point in the front, and I like the close-fitting sleeves, and I feel like one thing that makes it feel really modern, though, is the arm size seem a little bit far away, I feel like they should have been perhaps a little bit closer towards the neckline because then that would give the sleeve a slightly more upper lift, which is kind of what you tend to see in fashion plates of the time. The sleeves of that time are really tight and very much upright as well. I also think that a standing collar rather than a foldover one would have given the outfit again a little bit more of a historical look, but like I said, I really do like the way this outfit looks on her and I think it's a great mix of nods to historical fashion mixed with sort of more modern elements which is kind of the intention of the show, I think, and I think they've done a really good job with it. You can also see that more modern side playing into the way that they do Enola's hair throughout the movie. They basically always have it down except for a couple of looks, and this is something that a lot of historical period films get wrong, is that 
Yes, people sometimes wore their hair down, but for upper class people, generally you would see a lot more of hair being put up or worn as half up, half down do's. This sort of all the way down for every scene type thing is something you see a lot in modern historical films. But again, this movie is not meant to be historically accurate, so it doesn't even matter anyways. And I actually really like the way they've chosen to do her hair because it kind of expresses her wild and free spirit. I also like the subtle influence of menswear in this look because you do start to see that a lot in the bustle era as well. A lot of bodices, for example, and a lot of them also button up, which is also a nod to menswear. An aspect I really loved about this film is that they actually don't give Enola that many outfit changes. In a lot of historical films or films set in the past, you tend to see a lot of different outfits. And this just wouldn't be very realistic because a lot of people only had a certain number of dresses that they could wear every day. I think throughout the movie, they only give her maybe five or six outfit changes, give or take. And that seems like a fairly realistic amount considering that it takes place over a number of days. I like it when movie costumes focus more on quality over quantity. And I definitely think that all of the looks, even though they lean a bit more modern, are really quality made. So I have my friend Nicholas here of Vintage Bullshit to talk about the menswear of Enola Holmes too, because I know pretty much absolutely nothing about menswear. What do you think about the menswear in the show? Well, I think generally it's it's pretty nice, pretty good. Um, I think we talked beforehand about a bit about um, you know the expectations. Since menswear moves a lot slower than than ladies wear, um, I'm already happy with you know productions picking up pieces that are historically in some sense like plus minus ten years uh, or something. And I think they did a quite decent job, but there are still some things. Mm, <laughs> Not really fitting into that, but I think we'll see in a minute. So what do you think about the superintendent here? The first thing I um, I see is the bowler hat, which is very, very shallow. Kind of looks very, very odd. And I uh, look through a couple of fashion plates and I can't see any bowlers have this low height. I think um, a higher bowler would be far more fashionable for the time. Uh, so that's a bit odd. The shawl collar on the coat was looked odd uh, first too. And it's very uncommon. But it's nice, it's a nice touch uh, to make him a bit more like an odd fella, uh, but it's perf perfectly historical. The detachable collar, uh, club collar at the shirt is cool. Uh, however, basically he's wearing business attire and uh, even for business attire um, for the 1880s plus minus 10 years, uh, I think a higher collar would be more appropriate, like a non turn down collar. But if you wear a um, like a club collar, it should be a lot higher. But maybe that's because the actor didn't want to wear an uncomfortably high collar. I don't know. The tie looks like a modern necktie. Mm, I mean, it doesn't really pop out because it's black anyway. But um, I think they could have done a little bit, bit better too there. Then we have Anola's sort of working class look. Aspects of this look do feel very 1885 to me. And then other parts of it feel a lot more 1890. And then some of them just feel plain modern. I really like the way her skirt is draped because it does create that slight bustle effect in the back, which is quite common for the era. And I like the use of the overskirt that's also being draped because that is something you saw a lot during that period. I also really like the purse that's at her waistband because you had all sorts of waist attaching purses and different gadgets at that time. A chatelaine is a really common one. It's one that I personally really love to wear and a lot of my friends that wear historical fashion also love to wear them. And a lot of women at the time also chose to wear them because they would basically contain everything that they needed throughout their day, in addition to being a nice type of decoration. The collar of her shirtwaist is what I think makes the look feel the least historical to me because there were definitely some turned down collars at the time for women's wear. But in 1890, for example, when you would really start to see a lot of these shirtwaist blouses, they tended to have a lot more of upright or standing collars instead. Or if they wore fold down, they'd generally be buttoned quite high up on the neck. I really like her little brown knitted jacket thing. I think that's a really sweet touch. In general, during the 1890s especially, you start to see a lot of new knitted garments, which is something you don't see as much in prior decades, but certainly it did exist here and there because knitting has a long history. But there are so many depictions of various knitted garments that you could get in magazines, especially during the 1890s. So we've got Sherlock and Lestrade here. What I really like is actually the coat uh, Lestrade is wearing. It looks a little bit odd. Uh, which is maybe because um, first it's very very long, but that's perfectly fine. Uh, it should be should be that long. I think generally uh, very long coats are underrated in classic menswear now. 
uh, anyway. And it, it has a lot of buttons, but that's also perfectly historical and cool. The shoulder construction is fine. Uh, it closes very high, that's cool. You can't really tell if the club collar uh, at the shirt is high enough, but definitely the, the bowler is a lot better than the one from the uh, superintendent. One of Enola's most memorable looks in this movie is her ball gown. And I think that this is probably the look that feels the most 1885 to me in the entire movie. They did a really good job with the construction of the skirt, especially. They had a proper overskirt and it has a bustle of gathers in the back. And also it has a pleated underskirt, which is very typical for the period. And the cut of the bodice is quite appropriate for the time. There were a lot of these low neck, no sleeve bodices for evening wear. I also really like the way that it comes to a point in the front of the bodice. That's something you did see a lot as well in 1885. I do really like the use of the flowers at the front because this is something you saw a lot. In fact, I feel like I actually know which fashion plate the costume designer probably took inspiration from for this look. I also like how few accessories they gave Enola because that kind of makes me feel as if she was sort of in a rush to put together the outfit, which is very much the case with what happens in the movie. I'm not giving any spoilers away though. <laughs> One thing I also found was interesting, which maybe was an intentional choice, is that her ball gown is front closing. And generally at the time, ball gowns would have been back closing because you'd have someone helping you to get dressed. There were certainly front closing ones as well, but I find that I see the back closing ones amongst the upper class to be a lot more common at the time. Why I find this to be an interesting choice is that it could imply that Enola is very independent and therefore she had to dress herself because obviously there would have been no one to help her get ready for the ball. So perhaps she specifically chose a front closing ball gown for that reason as well. I also think they actually included some kind of corsetry throughout most of this movie, which is really wonderful because in a lot of historical films, sometimes they won't use corsetry at all or they'll use very modern corsetry, which doesn't quite create the same silhouette, but I would say that in this ball gown, her silhouette seems fairly accurate to the time. In general, they did a pretty good job with the ball gown, especially considering that some films which are actually trying to be historically accurate do a far worse job than Enola Holmes 2 did, and they're not even trying to go for historical accuracy in the first place. If you've ever noticed how in historical films, the extras often look a lot better dressed and more period appropriate, I actually learned a pretty interesting fact, which is that with some costume departments in large movies or historical shows, they'll actually rent out or buy actual antiques from the era and have the extras wear them. And that's why you tend to see extremely period accurate clothing for people in the background. That's because sometimes it actually is something from that era. You see that in Enola Holmes too as well. You can tell that the background actors really do look like they're from the second bustle era in a lot of cases. And that could perhaps be because they actually are wearing real antiques from the time. I'm not sure how I feel about that ethics wise, but uh, that's a conversation for another video. Lord Tewksbury here, he's in the park walking. I guess he's walking to the court. He looks very, very handsome on the picture um, but the first thing I noticed is the coat because it, it's a raglan coat it's it constructed differently than your your usual Ulster coat and in theory they had raglan coats um, in the 1880s but they're far from being fashionable I, I don't recall any fashion plate depicting a, a raglan coat so I do love the the high collar the uh, the top hat the striped pants I mean he's a young guy and in the 1880s still like checked fabrics are far more fashionable but again he's an, he's a young guy so maybe he's a bit uh, ahead of his time, so already sporting the stripes. Now the fancy waistcoat is actually something that would uh, is that is not very fashionable for for the 1880s. So I, I would say he should uh, really drop the the fancy waistcoat and I don't know go some, for something something striped according to the suit or the, the fancy waistcoat is is. Uh, I'd say like 30, 30 years too too late. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It sort of reminded me a bit of like an early Victorian yeah, waistcoat exactly. that you would see. So this is Lord Tewksbury again, but this time he's in Parliament. In terms of menswear, it might look a bit boring because it's mostly black. <laughs> but um, I mean, he's in the, I think in the House of Lords or something. So perfectly fine for a formal occasion. I don't know what I uh, saw instantly was the guy in the, in the back row sporting the huge bow tie. And this is maybe something a little bit too fancy uh, and also a little bit too late for for the um, uh, for the 1880s but expectations for menswear are usually not that high so I'm, I'm fine with that I'm always happy with like sprinkling in a little bit of fancy uh, just to I don't know skip all the 
black and black formal menswear attire so i'm i'm happy with the fancy bow tie there so now this is a like like a historically perfect accurate um, occasion for a fancy waistcoat because in the 1880s you still have those fancy white waistcoats for evening wear um so this is perfectly fine and i think it's awesome because it it's also a little bit of fancy what I do think is a bit uh, out of the ordinary again is the, the fancy bow tie on the left because uh, in the 1880s you already had usually the, the small bow ties which you can see in the middle and, the, and on, on the right. But all in all the, the, the take holds are nice. Um, the, the silhouette is okay. I mean you can still see that the construction is a bit more modern. You don't have that much slope in the shoulders fr um, from the neck down but it's fine. And I mean uh, generally like inaccuracies are fine with me as long as they add something and they do in this case so the final outfit of anola's that i'm going to be reviewing is this blue walking suit that she's wearing this is actually probably my least favorite outfit from the movie and there's a few reasons why firstly the cut of it feels a lot more 1890s in general i think this is probably one of her looks that feels the most modern and perhaps costumey throughout the film there's of course nothing wrong with being modern or costumey and perhaps as well it was their intentional or stylistic choice to, to make the outfit like this but i think there are a few things that they could have done differently that would just make it tie into the rest of the film a lot better. Firstly, one thing I noticed is that they use an extremely slubbed silk for the bodice. And there's of course nothing wrong with Dupioni or slubbed silk. But the thing is that there aren't a lot of other garments throughout the movie that also have this more slubbed silk. Most of the other looks tend to have more of a shiny or glossy silk taffeta, like the one that her mother is wearing at the left of her in this shot. So the texture of her bodice to me just feels like it really stands out from everything else. That could be a good thing, but I also feel like it doesn't necessarily match with the other costumes. I do really like the use of the split skirt here, which is a skirt that can button up in the front and then unbutton and basically turn into a pair of pants. You've probably seen the secret pants thing going around. Well, these are probably secret pants. But again, you tend to see the split skirt a lot more when cycling culture comes into play in Victorian England, which was a lot more in the 1890s for women. So it's still quite off from the 1885 time period. There are a few things that I really like about her bodice and I think that they did well. Firstly, they used a sort of classic high collar, which you see a lot during the time period. And also I feel like the arms eyes are in a fairly good place. But overall, I think they did a decent job with the way that the shoulders look. Overall, not bad. My first intuition was that's not a proper Inverness uh, coat or cape. If it's a coat or a cape, I can't really tell because uh, it depends on whether it has sleeves and especially in this shot you can really see if it has sleeves and if it's uh, the sleeve of the jacket or uh, of the coat but it doesn't matter. You can really see a lapel on the on the coat and the usual cut of an of an Inverness cape works a bit differently without having a proper lapel. I went through um, a couple of my fashion plates but I actually found um, an Inverness cape cut like this so yeah, it's fine again. Uh, it's really fine. And, and um, I mean, I, I made uh, two of those Inverness caps for myself because I just love this kind of uh, uh, of coat or cape. So uh, yeah, it's it's great. Even though I think Sherlock is always uh, mentioned with an Ulster coat, and this is not an Ulster coat. I don't know who added the the Inverness uh, thing to to Sherlock Holmes. As soon as you wear the damn coat, you look like Sherlock Holmes. I can really tell you. And, and you don't even need the Deerstalker, Bowler's perfectly fine. I hope you enjoyed watching this review of Enola Holmes 2. A big thanks to Vintage Bolsha for collaborating on this video. Be sure to go and check out his YouTube channel, it's absolutely amazing. And if you want to learn more about historical menswear especially, I highly recommend subscribing to it. Thanks again to June's Journey for sponsoring this video. Be sure to download their free game using the link in the description box below if you'd like to experience your own detective mystery. If you'd like to hear what I think Bridgerton actors get wrong about corsets, be sure to watch this video next.